as the crow flies on the Vance Crow Podcast. Spencer Wells, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Um, yeah, happy to be talking to you from Indonesia. Thank God for high-speed internet. This is amazing. So I am speaking with um, a person that is a National Geographic explorer in residence, or was at one point in time, is a yeah. uh, major figure in population genetics and has figured out how humans have uh, spread across the world and is also a present day adventurer. You are right now in Indonesia, and I believe a volcano just exploded not far from where you're at. <laughs> Um, what's going on? What are you doing in Indonesia during on April 11th, 2020 during the coronavirus? Well, so my one of the things that I had the amazing opportunity to do when I was with National Geographic was design and lead private jet tours around the world, um, which was really awesome. I did nine of them and, you know, figured out what was really good about those and what was not so good. And a a couple of years ago, I started talking to a couple of people who had been my mentors in this space and, you know, ended up forming a company to do this ourselves, but with much smaller groups. So, you know, if you typically go on one of these trips, you're with 80 plus people. It's, it's a very, very nice bus tour experience. It's like a cruise. And, you know, no one wants to go on a cruise these days. Um, so we do much smaller trips. We're limited to eight to ten people. We take smaller jets that allow us to go to much more interesting locations. We can land in smaller airports. And, yeah, we were leaving a trip through Indonesia. Um, credit to the guests who believed in me. Um, this is part of the reason why I started watching the, the coronavirus outbreak so carefully back in late January. Um, you know, it, it was very clear that this was going to be something that would threaten our trip. And we were able to get everybody through safely and they had a wonderful time. We had to evacuate everybody just before the last stop. Um, they flew out from Denpasar in Bali, which is a major international airport. And, you know, took Emirates home via Dubai. Um, And my wife and I were like, you know, we're looking at what's going on in America and it doesn't look so good. So we decided to stay on in Indonesia. And so that's how we ended up here. We were on a very, very remote island um, off the coast of Sumbawa, which is an island that nobody ever goes to in Indonesia. If you've been to Indonesia, you've most likely been to Bali. And east of Bali is Lombok, which is where we are now. And east of Lombok is Sumbawa, and that's mostly known for a copper and gold mine. Um, (laughs) And we were off the north coast of Sumbawa. So it was like planes, trains, and automobiles in order to get there. But it was a wonderful place. And we were there for about two and a half weeks. And, you know, the the, the corporate um, people who ran the resort um, decided – you know, in, in consultation with us, I mean, we had long discussions about this, that it didn't make sense to keep it open. And so, um, they, they shut it down about a week ago and we took a trip. Um, you can read about it on my blog. Hopefully you'll stick a link in there in your show notes. Oh, I was reading Uh, it last night. It's wild, man. It's, you were talking about spear fishing and getting generators started trains and automobiles getting to Lombok and now we're in this like awesome walled compound. So, you know, I went out today for the first time in a week, um, took out a little motor scooter and rode around town and there's nobody out in the roads. And I carried a mask in my pocket and everybody's wearing masks when they go into enclosed spaces. And it's, you know, it's it's weird. It's really weird being outside the U.S. while all this is happening. I mean, the, I have been – this is the third crisis that I've been witnessing from outside the U.S. I was living in England in 2001 when 9-11 happened, and I was – you know, traveling in the former Soviet Union when the financial crisis happened in 2008. 
And, and so, you know, this is another one. And it's just like, it's so weird to be witnessing this right now. What makes it so weird? Why, why, what do you see when you're abroad that you don't see when you're in the United States? The, the U S is very insular. Um, you know, I read the New York times and the wall street journal every morning and all the reporting is literally about how is this going to affect the Americans and, and so on. And then I read the Straits Times and I read the Jakarta Post and I read the South China Morning Post and I read the BBC. And, you know, this is a global event. This is unprecedented, not only in our lifetimes, but in the last few centuries. Um, This is not only a financial downturn that is going to be as big as the Great Depression in the 1930s. It's not only a pandemic that's going to be as lethal as the 1918 flu pandemic. To me, this the the only thing that rivals it in history, and I'm a you know I'm a student of history, and this is kind of what I do. You know, I use genetics to study history. Um, you know, the 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 Black Plague in the the 17th century. I mean, that's what you have to go back to to really get a sense of holy of- shit, man. Like nobody is saying that this this like people are talking about we're about ready to go back to work, and that no. uh, it's not going to happen. It's not, and, and if it does, there will be another peak. So I've talked a lot on Twitter, and you know I'm writing a, a um, article for MIT Tech Review right now about multiple waves and how we actually go back to work. But as soon as you relax those waves, I mean, look at what's going on in Singapore. That is the best example. I wrote an article for MIT Tech Review a month ago saying that Singapore had the best response in the world. It was on top of everything. And now Singapore is locking everything down because they relaxed everything and people are becoming infected. There are these community infections that are coming up. This is a really, really wily virus. And, you know, we're not going to get back to normal anytime soon. So the reason that I started this podcast was because I observed – so you and I were speaking just before we started. I spent some time in Africa, and it's there where people are living at the base layer. They have so little margin for error, uh, and they don't have police force, and they don't have way- – so I on several occasions saw what happens when a mob gets together – and they decide we need justice or we need this problem to, to stop. And so my perception was we now have the possibility for much stronger mobs to grow because you have this um, very narrow set of views that are being talked about on the news. And when you're doing social media, you think you have a wide swath of opinions, but really you just have the people that are connected one hop or maybe two hops away from your network. Yeah. To hear you talk about this, I can tell you that there is no one in the United States that I have heard heard saying that they're going to compare it to the Black Plague. Do you do this because you want people to take it more seriously? Like, it's so stark to me that you would say that. Help me understand why you get to that conclusion. So I'm not doing this for any sort of like social media prominence or a desire to become famous as a prognosticator. I am literally like, if I'm wrong, and I, honest to God, hope I'm wrong, really, if I'm wrong, everybody's going to be safe. But if I'm right, like a lot of people are going to die. And society is changing. I mean, my God, the the unemployment rate in the US in three weeks has gone to 15%. It's probably going to go to 30% by June. Um, this is literally unprecedented. And so, you know, we, we look at all these events that are happening around the world and, and, you know, as the virus emerges and it, you know, it's clearly mimicking the, the, the seasonal flu. Um, you know, so we look at how flu outbreaks happen. They tend to happen in the Northern hemisphere, in the Northern hemisphere winter, um, you know, between October and March. Um, They tend to happen in the Southern Hemisphere on the opposite side of that. You know, this looks very much like that. I think coronavirus is going to stick around for a long time. It's about 10 times as lethal as the average, you know, seasonal flu, at least. 
It, and it, you know, depends very much on which demographic group you're in. So, you know, if you have pre-existing conditions like pulmonary issues and heart disease, if you're obese, you know, obesity is a major issue in America. And this is part of the reason why I think, you know, African-Americans in the U.S. have been hit so hard is that obesity, particularly among women in African-American communities, have, you know, incredibly high rates of obesity, like 60%. Um, you know, it, it's going to kill a lot of people. This is not just the flu. And so, you know, I'm looking at all of this and it's like, you know, it's, it's really scary. It's really scary. And we can get into some of the issues about, I, I'm working on a, a piece right now about, you know, genetic predispositions to outcomes. And I think there are, you know, a lot of those because, you know, if you look at healthy young people, so people under the age of 50, let's say, um, there are a lot of people who get the disease and they ha have no symptoms. And there are a lot of people who get the disease and they die very quickly. They crash. They go on respirators. And, you know, the death rate for people who go on respirators is about 50 percent, according to the UK right now. Um you know, and so there are a lot of genetic components that probably go into that. And, you know, we're just unpacking this virus right now. It's it's very interesting to me as an evolutionary biologist and somebody who studied virology as an undergrad a long time ago. Um, you know, I was fascinated by virology because of the HIV epidemic that I lived through in the 80s, you know, as a heterosexual straight man. Um, never caught it, thank God. But, you know, this was very much top of mind in the 1980s for every Gen Xer. It's like, oh, my God, you, you know, we came out of the sexual revolution in the 60s and the 70s. And, you know, suddenly there's something that can kill you. Um, you know, so this is this is comparable. This is going to have a huge impact, in my opinion. I have daughters who are millennial age now and, you know, they're they're really, you know, they're taking this pretty hard. Yeah, socially, it, it it strikes me when you watch commercials right now, if you have the regular television on and you see a commercial, anything that is dated pre-March 10th, they have people gathering together, shaking hands, talking, <laughs> being close, and it feels so disjointed. And that only took a few weeks to make that be completely uh, culturally disdained. You, you brought up genetics, and there is a lot floating around right now of probably the most simple genetics, which are people saying, hey, I have A, a positive blood. That means it's, it's going to be harder on me versus O positive or whatever. What do you give credence to how much we know about really basic stuff like that? We, we know nothing right now. I mean, listen, blood groups, blood groups are the first human – genetic polymorphism that we discovered. Carl Landsteiner in 1901 described the ABO blood groups. And we've known about these for obviously well over a century as a result. And, you know, it's, it's a really simple way of categorizing people into risk pools in the same way that the Greeks could have figured out that old people tend to die from this more than young people. You know, so we've known about the the, the simple stuff for 4,000 years, 3,000 years. Um, you know, to me, the, the intelligent approach to this is going to be figuring out the real genetic components. And so we know that the virus, for instance, has an interaction with the ACE2 protein that's expressed on the surface of cells in the lungs and the, the nasopharyngeal complex of the nose and the back of the throat. Um, you know, so ACE2 variation is probably going to play a role, but I think, you know, HLA variation, the human leukocyte antigen, the most polymorphic part of the human genome. I mean, there are protein variants that date back millions of years in the HLA system. And this is a system that, you know, this is what you match when you do a tissue transplant. So if somebody does a liver transplant, for instance, or a kidney transplant, you try to match these because your body doesn't want to recognize whatever the new organ is as being foreign. Um, but these genes are really developed. They've evolved over billions of years, um, certainly hundreds of millions. You need to think about that, possibly billions, but hundreds of millions of years to fight off viruses essentially. And so HLA is almost certainly going to be very important in this. 
I think some of the innate immunity responses, like the toll-like receptors, the TLRs, um, are also going to be really important. I mean, it, it, anybody who studied human population genetics and immunology, and I've studied both, can tell you, like, these are the candidate genes that we need to be looking at right now. And I think there's going to be a strong correlation, especially with HLA types and responses to this infection, because, you know, the, the data that's coming out is that a lot of people are asymptomatic. You know, they, they you know, possibly 10 times as many people as are being detected in these random screenings. And so you've got this huge pool of people out there who are infected with the virus and they can spread it but they never show any symptoms and they probably have genetic, you know, components or attributes that allow them to, you know, live with this thing in the way that the bats did, the natural hosts of this, as far as we know. I mean, we're, we're assuming right now, based on the early research, that bats are where this came from. But, you know, probably there are people out there who are able to spread this and show no symptoms and they are going to serve as a reservoir moving, moving forward. But some people, and we know that old people, people with pre-existing pulmonary conditions, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, all the easy stuff to figure out, they're, they're particularly susceptible. But it's also the 27-year-old who runs triathlons, who crashes and burns in New York City. Those are the people who are really interesting to me because they're the ones who give us the genetic insight potentially into why this thing is so deadly in some cases and not others. And moving forward, that's how we choose to categorize risk. It's not just based on age and pre-existing conditions. As we start to re-engage, you know, and we can't stay locked down forever. I mean, no, we're already at the point where this is going to be as bad as the Great Depression economically. <clears throat> and so, you know, how do we get past that? People have to start to re-engage in the economy. They have to go back to work. You have to do that intelligently, though. And what worries me is that as we're seeing, like I'm in East Asia now. Singapore did a fantastic job early on, you know, mapping all the cases and doing contact tracing and everything else that you're supposed to do in this sort of situation. And they had been exposed to SARS in 2002, 2003. And now they have one of the worst outbreaks in Southeast Asia. And I had no idea of this. This is this is like if, if I disagreed with you, I would have no way to say it because I have not heard this at all. But, it, but it's, it's like what's going to happen is until we figure out a way to intelligently disengage from the lockdown, we're going to go through waves of this. And so we're going to see the death rate and the infection rate start to drop. And then we're going to, you know, relax things a little bit. People are going to go out into society. There's going to be a reservoir of people who reinfect people who are really susceptible. They're going to get super sick, go back into the hospital. The government's going to lock down again. And so there are, there are going to be these waves. And, you know, it's, it's ultimately very predictable if you know anything about viral behavior. But it's, you know, unfortunately, policymakers are not guided by science. They're guided by mostly economics these days. So while you study how uh, genetics moves, I would say that I am a student of culture. That's my, my I, I really want to know why people are doing what they're doing in this present moment. And I am observing that people have these conversations with themselves about how the virus is and how serious it is and how other people are reacting. And so the thing that you're describing plays into the narrative of, let's say, somebody on the more traditional right-left uh, spectrum. The people on the right say, well, this is the left's dream. They want to shut everything down, so they want to make this disease as scary as possible. I don't think that they're doing that on the on the right because they're foolhardy or or dangerous. They're just doing it because for them – the economy and getting the traditional, the way things set up, uh, back set up, that they want that good thing. How do you bridge that divide? Somebody with your amount of, of information about this, how do you describe, hey, I'm not just telling you that there are waves because you should be scared, but these are waves because this is what the evidence tells us? Well, so, you know, I've, I've made this comment several times on Twitter and social media. You can't spend money when you're dead. 
Um, we can always crawl our way back out of a financial crisis. We've done it before. We will do it again. This will not be the last time that the world goes into a capitalist financial crisis. Um, but if you die, like there's no way of coming back from that. And so, you know, a, a person that, you know, I follow on social media and who I admire, very good writer, a guy named Jeffrey Miller, um, commented early on in all of this, you know, the people who overreacted to crises like this in the past, we call survivors. And the people who didn't overreact died. And so, you know, given the choice, do you want to live or do you want to die? Um, I'd rather crawl out from a deeper financial crisis than, you know, bury more bodies, honestly. Yeah, there. Eric Weinstein was talking about uh, how this is so deeply enmeshed in the Jewish tradition, right? Where they tell the story of Passover about the people that didn't wait for their bread to be leavened and instead... They had flatbread, they ate it, and they moved on. And he was like... Matzah. That, we all love matzah. Did you do a Seder? I'm not Jewish. This is all... This, oh, is, this okay. is not... Uh, this is like me I, trying I, I, to I, dabble in a culture I don't know. <laughs> I'm an Episcopalian. I mean, you know, dude, look at my hair. But <laughs> anyway, um, no, I mean, absolutely. You know, it's it's like... It, this is biblical. There's a there's a massive locust outbreak in East Africa in the Middle East right now. Horrifying. The biggest one in generations. There are three volcanoes erupting nearby where I am in Indonesia right now. You know, the world is just like saying no. I mean, what is going on with humanity? And so, you know, I I honestly I'm not terribly spiritual. I'm certainly not religious. But I do feel like, you know, we have to take some cues from what nature is telling us. And nature is telling us right now that whatever we've been doing for the last, you know, few generations ain't working that well. So when you talk about the Black Plague, or I'm certain most of population genetics has huge amounts of disease in it, what do we know about how people would have handled this in the past? I mean, certainly there were other corona novel coronaviruses or something in this line. What happened in the past? Well, the germ theory for disease was really only discovered by Louis Pasteur in the middle part of the 19th century. Um, you know, and smallpox vaccine dates from the early 19th century. Um, you know, people knew nothing about what was causing these things. And so imagine yourself. And, and this is why it's really interesting for me to be in a place like Indonesia right now, which has this mix of like animist culture and Buddhism and Hinduism and of course Islam, which is the you know largest religion in the country, but it's it's all mixed together in a really complicated way. Um, you know what's interesting to me is that you know in these traditional societies, they they really don't understand that there is a a thing out there that's isolatable, that is identifiable that can be targeted by potential treatments and vaccines, um, you know, it's essentially like being back in that pre-germ theory era. And so, you know, if you imagine yourself in the Black Plague era, you know, watch The Seventh Seal, um, which is a wonderful movie by Ingmar Bergman, um, came out in the 1950s, which is about, you know, a soldier in the Crusades returning to Sweden plagued by, you know, Black Black death, black plague. Um, you know, imagine yourself being back in one of these pre-scientific eras, and it's scary as hell. I mean, you don't know what's causing this. It's like the gods are punishing you for something. And, you know, a lot of people around the world have that same worldview these days. And so it must be terrifying, absolutely terrifying. I mean, you know, I'm a scientist. I kind of understand the proximal causes. I don't understand the distal causes. Nobody does. Like, What's the why did this happen? Those two? You know, What's the difference between those two? Well, the proximal cause is, you know, it's a virus. It's a coronavirus with the 30 KB RNA genome, and it's mutating at a certain rate, and we can study the pattern of mutations. We can study the immune response, everything else. But the distal cause is, like, why did this thing enter the human population in the first place? Um, what happened? 
Was it a wet market in Wuhan? Has it been circulating for years as some people, including, you know, very established scientists at the NIH, um, you know, has it been circulating for years in the human population and suddenly mutated? We don't know. We don't know the distal cause. We know the proximal cause. It's, it's, you know, an RNA virus and, you know, I'm a scientist. And so that gives me some faith in our ability to attack this and to study it. But if you don't have that, oh my God, like this is terrifying. It's, it's like a locust plague. You don't know why it's happening to you, but you know that it's going to kill you and your family. Well, um, I, I think I know, would make terrifying. the case that, you know, if we think of intelligence as spread out on a, on a standard distribution, you know, a bell curve, I think that we're not that far away from the Middle Ages as far as people's ability to understand the disease on, on any level of sophistication. So, for example, for me, I can't go read a paper and say, oh, now I have a deeper understanding of this. At the end of the day, I have to find who I choose to believe and the faith that I have in either the scientists or the person telling me that we need to get the economy going. It really comes down to which God are you going to make sacrifices in belief of? Um, is it to go back to work? Is it to listen and, and hole up? Because we don't know more than, I mean, we can hear from experts and that message can spread much further. But for the most part, people can't know the virus deeply. They can only know what somebody else can tell them about it. No, I think you're right. And this is something that, you know, I've railed against for years. I mean, I'm 51 years old. Um, you know, as Bill Clinton famously said, I have more yesterdays than tomorrow's. Um, you know, I'm Gen X and I've lived through a lot of things and I've seen a lot of stuff come and go. I grew up in the immediate post Nixon, post Vietnam era. I was born in 1961 um, and, you know, grew up under the threat of communist nuclear annihilation, saw that disappear in 1990. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that has gone on. One of the things that has always bothered me is that, you know, throughout all of this, my lifetime, there are more people who consider it, you know, far more important to learn about Shakespeare sonnets than about how your own body works, you know, so basic biology. Um, you know, I feel like if more people had been taught science in junior high, high school, college, if there had been more required classes in those areas, um, you know, we would perhaps be in better shape right now. I'm, you know, I, I feel like, you know, America, for some reason, there was a study that was done. I, I wrote about this in a, in a book that I published in 2010 called Pandora's Seed. America is unique among the OECD countries, so the rich countries in the world in terms of this bizarre anti-correlation between religion and acceptance of things like evolution, which is about, you know, being schooled about biology, basically. Um, you know, we're down around where Turkey is and we're a huge anomaly among the OECD countries. Um, you know, and de Tocqueville wrote about this. I mean, America's particularly religious. He said that Americans love to form clubs in part because they've all moved there from somewhere else relatively recently. I mean, there are lots of sociological, you know, avenues you could investigate on this. But at the end of the day, like, I just feel like more science education would help to prevent things like this from happening. And they would help our leaders, you know, the people in Congress that we rely on, we elect them, we pay their salaries. We pay the president's salary. It would help them, you know, to better make decisions that could protect people, honestly. You know, you know I'm I was very disappointed in the way the U.S. government has reacted to this. I was talking with uh, Yosha Bach and – well, no, I'm, I'm trying to think where I heard this. But it, it was basically – he was making the case. He's an artificial intelligence researcher, used to work at MIT. And he was basically saying – we had a selection pressure for presidential candidates that was for in a postmodernist era where things are much more about theater of getting things done because we didn't face an existential threat. 
And existential threats isolate what should you be paying attention to. If you have very few concerns, very few worries, now stuttering Shakespeare's sonnets make total sense. Whereas when you are facing down a war, now all of a sudden parents look at their kids and they say, you're not studying Shakespeare, you're getting your ass in there and you're figuring out how to grow crops or you're figuring out how to solve diseases. Absolutely. I mean, there's a reason they call it the greatest generation. They lived through the Depression. They went off and they fought off fascism in Europe and in East Asia. And they came back and they built the greatest economy in the history of the world. That is what I love about America. And something has happened to our country in the last, you know, basically the whole time I've been growing up. I mean, I, I've been lucky enough to deal with the largesse of that. You know, the 80s and the 90s were an amazing time to be alive. To be a young kid, we didn't have to worry about anything. Everybody like could pursue whatever they wanted to do. We didn't have to worry about being drafted and going up to Vietnam. We didn't have to worry about, you know, threats from the Nazis. We could literally do whatever we wanted. And, and in, I just in many feel cases, like, you that, know, that created uh, an existential angst about people. I know for me, it was like, I can be whatever I want to be. So now I don't know what I'm going to do. Like now, oh, there's so many options. And I right. th like that is such a rarity. You have paths, just like fingers on your hand. And if you take this one, you can't take that one. So like you don't take any of them. And and it, it you're right. It becomes an existential angst. One of the things that I've observed, so I've been in the biotech, uh, agricultural crops are very important. You've got to um, use this technology because it allows us to do things like use less pesticides. And I got into a class of scientists that understand deeply how the genetics works and how you can test these things. Now, when we flipped from biotech over to we have this virus and this epidemic and it's terrible, one of the things that I've observed is that th there are many times when they're like, well, the correct answer is lockdown. And if we find a vaccine, it's mandatory. And I've been trying to make the case that you don't just get to decide what the masses do. You have to convince them through some sort of theater, whether it's play acting, whether it's books, through its songs, through pop culture. I don't know. But you have to get people to agree that the way that you seek is correct is the way that you're going to do it because you cannot force billions of people to do something they don't understand. I think you are one of the great science communicators of all time. What do you see? Who do you see doing a good job of explaining how things should go and, and what lessons should scientists be learning from them? Well, listen, you know, people like Carl Zimmer on the New York times, you know, follow him on Twitter. He's very good. Um, you know, Ed Young is doing a great job of explaining the science, but in terms of that interface between science and culture, um, there aren't that many people who are making the crossover. I think a lot of people are very afraid right now because there's so many unknowns about the science and, you know, we're in uncharted territory in terms of the, the social impacts. Um, I agree with you. Like we cannot shut down society forever. We it just, you know, the world cannot stop working like we're already going into something as big as the Great Depression. That is a foregone conclusion. One hundred percent certainty. Unemployment by July in the United States will be over 30 percent. I guarantee that. And so we haven't encountered anything like that, you know, in, in our lifetimes. There's no social you know memory of this. Like, what do you do when that happens? Like the WPA, you know, FDR, do we start hiring artists and, you know, builders and, you know, engineers to build the, the Golden Gate Bridge, which came out of that whole era? Um, we don't know. I mean, that's that's something that we've got to figure out moving forward. Um, you know, I, I think that scientists who understand the interplay between something like this, an event like this, the scientific and medical aspects, and how it has an impact on culture are really important right now, and there aren't that many of them. Um, you know, I want the world to go back to work. Listen, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I've started multiple businesses, you know, tech startups, 
I own a nightclub in Austin, Texas. I own a travel business. I mean, the latter two are shut down for the foreseeable future. So my income has taken a huge hit. Like I've got skin in the game here. This is not just an academic exercise for me. Um, you know, we need to get the world back to work, but we have to do it intelligently. And so, you know, again, I'm working on a piece that hopefully will help us figure out how to assign risk pools. You know, so there are some people who have very low risk, largely based on age, health and genetics, who can go back to work. And, you know, there shouldn't be any issue. I mean, my daughter chose to stay in New York during all of this. She was doing an internship at NBC at the Today Show. Um, you know, she could have gone back to Europe and, you know, sat this out with her sister and my ex-wife in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, but she chose to stay in New York and I'm very concerned about her, but because she's otherwise healthy and young and female and, you know, as we start to unpack all these risk factors, that's actually a very low risk group. You know, I'm not that worried about her in terms of health. Um, but there are people, you know, if you're over 60, if you're obese, if you're African American, if you have type two diabetes, um, you know, you have every reason to be very concerned because there's probably like a 30, 40% chance if you catch this thing, you're going to end up on a respirator and half the people who, who end up on respirators die, they die. And so, you know, this is a very serious disease, but we can start to sort people into risk pools and decide, you know, when we need to re-engage with the economy, some risk pools are safe to kind of go out and about and get back to work and keep the economy going, which is so important for everybody. And some, like, you can't do that. Like, we have to figure out, is there a vaccine solution? Is there something else? Do we need to keep you sequestered somewhere, safe from this virus? I mean, that's a whole different issue. And that's what the medical community is working on, you know, in addition to treating the, you know, the acute cases, but it's like, okay, so how do we come up with a long-term medical solution to this? But the short term is you just don't go out. Like you stay locked down at home. Um, but there are other people who can go out and they're not going to be affected. And if they catch it, they don't have any symptoms. I mean, I've had friends who've caught this and they have, you know, minimal symptoms. Um, you know, so it, there's just this huge heterogeneity in what happens if you catch the virus. And we need to understand that better. And I think genetics, you know, that's the key understanding more about the genetics of how otherwise healthy people react to the viral infection. And I mean, that really, truly is the value of diversity. We've been talking about the value of diversity for the last five, 10 years in this weird postmodernist way about, you know, who should be hired and who should get a chance on the stage. And now all of a sudden we're seeing <clears throat> you want genetic diversity because that is how you solve uh, one one key getting into everybody's locks and killing everybody. You want that diversity because you need as much genetic spread as you as you can have. I actually, I, I remember watching a Nat Geo uh, video that you were doing about the benefit of all this diversity. Changing the subject a little bit, one of the big parts of population genetics is migration, right? It's people got up from where they were and they moved for, for whatever reason. Uh, maybe it was the, the famine or war or whatever it was. Do you believe that in a modern age, this type of disease will cause mass migration such that 100 or 1,000 years from now, people will be able to track it back to this? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I, you know, I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it in that way. I mean, in terms of like immediate causes, what I'm most concerned about is the refugees in Syria who are waiting at the border of Turkey to, to get out, get away from ISIS. And, you know, those people are essentially living in abject poverty with very poor health conditions, no access to modern health care, no access. I mean, describe no abject poverty to people that haven't seen it before. Abject poverty is a dollar a day. Imagine living on a dollar a day anywhere in the world. I'm in Indonesia. It's cheap. A dollar a day wouldn't buy you a bowl of rice. Abject poverty is something no one in America has ever experienced. Abject poverty means that your children are starving the whole time they're growing up. You are much more likely as a mother to die 
in childbirth and your children are much more likely to die during childbirth. Abject poverty means that you have a life expectancy in the 40s to possibly around age 50. Abject poverty is scary as hell. Um, that's what people in Syria are living with right now. And, you know, to the extent that they can get across the border and that they're afraid and aware of the threat that this virus is creating, um, yeah, I think that it will cause migrations. Um, you know, it's, it's not as big an instigator of migration as other things. Um, people have always moved for the same basic human reasons. I mean, lack of opportunity at home and the desire to create better opportunities elsewhere. And in the Paleolithic era, which is, you know, 50,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago, the great migrations around the world, that was food and water. Um, now it's economic opportunities. You know, you don't want to live on a dollar a day. You don't, you don't want to do that anywhere in the world. There is no place where that is a living wage. And so, you know, that's the reason people keep coming to America, why the American dream still holds true. That's the reason why people migrate to cities out of villages, because, you know, they're willing to give up comfort in order to make a little bit more money and support their families and hopefully keep them healthy. Um, you know, this this is going to be a big hit to the world's big economies, the U.S., China, Europe some of the countries in South America and the Middle East. But where it really scares me is the death, destruction, and absolutely potentially apocalyptic nature of how it's going to play out in places like India and Africa um, and in parts of Southeast Asia. I mean, I'm in Indonesia right now. That's the fourth most populous country in the world. It's got 270 million people. It's the fourth after the U.S., so China, India, U.S., Indonesia. Most people don't even realize that, that Indonesia has that many people. It's the most populous Muslim nation in the world. But, um, you know, it's a poor place, and there are a lot of people living on a dollar a day here. And, you know, if this thing takes hold in a place like Indonesia or India or sub-Saharan Africa, it is going to be death that we haven't seen on a scale like this since the Black Plague. Honestly, and it's, it makes me very sad as somebody who's done so much of his work as a, as a scientist in all of these parts of the world. I saw those videos of Ecuador where people were dying in the barrios and there's no ambulance coming to pick those people up. So they drag the body away from their house and put it in front of somebody else's house. And you see these aren't bad people. They just they don't have options and they don't. And. I, I, I am also concerned about the disease spreading into these uh, highly populated, very poor places, the slums of Kibera, which was where I uh, kind of near where I lived in Kenya. I can't even imagine what they would do if if uh, a sickness rolled through there. It's it's um, it'll be. It, and, and do you think that is a certainty? Will it absolutely get there or is there a way to see? We don't it know. Off? I mean, the, the, there are two big conundrums, I think. You know, and I've, I've gone through this on a podcast that we did recently for, you know, The Insight, which is the podcast I do with Razib Khan. But, you know, the, the two big conundrums so far have been Sweden and India for me, because I feel like I have a pretty clear sense of how this disease takes hold and starts to spread in a society. It comes into a highly cosmopolitan city. And, you know, that's mostly through travelers from other countries who are spreading it and they don't realize they have it and they're asymptomatic and they spread it in the community and people start to fan out from there. And that's where, you know, you get these these outbreaks in the U.S. In the U.S., oh, my God, I mean, today the U.S. passed 500,000 cases. We have far more cases than China. I mean, even if you assume that China is lying you know, through their teeth about the numbers, the U.S. still has far more cases than China has had. Um, China may have a lot of deaths that are unreported, but the U.S. is super scary. And it's partially because Americans travel so much. So these countries, you know, who have lots of travelers coming in, cities and in, in these places. Um, so anyway, you know, Sweden is starting to tick up. So Sweden you know, unlike the other Nordic countries and other European countries, has decided that people will not be locked down at home. It's up to individuals to, you know, 
protect themselves and maintain that six foot distance. Although there was a um, study that came out earlier today that in fact you have to maintain at least a 13 foot distance distance. And so six feet isn't enough. Um, you know, again, we're learning so much about this as time goes on. And so don't believe anything definitive that I say or anyone else says about this. We could all be wrong. We could be disproven. That's the way science works. But, um, no, I mean, India has been the other big anomaly. It's like, you know, it's this big country with a lot of slums. Um, you know, if you've seen Slumdog Millionaire, you know, that that's a slum in Mumbai that has 1.5 million people essentially living in rabbit hutches. I mean, we talk about a dollar a day. These people are making less than a dollar a day. And they're living on top of each other with families of six, eight, ten people. Um, you know, and the question is, why hasn't it exploded there? And I feel like it's simmering. I feel like it came in relatively late to places like that. I feel like the rich in India have done a pretty good job of isolating themselves and they're the ones who have traveled the most and have been the most likely to transmit it. But it has taken hold in some of these slum areas and it's simmering at the moment. It's like a cobra and it's going to strike at some point. The question is whether the climate will influence that. And, you know, climate is complicated because there are some issues with temperature and relative humidity that a lot of scientists are talking about. Personally, I feel like the climate issues are more about in the tropics where I am now, you spend most of your day outside. And, you know, if, if you're in a room with somebody who has this virus, you're 18 times more likely to catch it inside than if you're standing at the same distance outside. That's data that came out of China about a week ago. And so living outside with air circulating is a good thing right now. Like be as paleo as you can. You know, that, um, that example you know, right there is something that was never explained even to me about why do cold spread in the winter? Well, it's because you're spending more time in the same circulated air as other people or in large part because of that. I, it just never dawned on me it. before. Think, think about going to, you know, a tightly packed, cubicle office space and you are breathing if i can be blunt other people's coughs sneezes burps farts you're literally breathing everything that comes out of their bodies and if this virus can transmit over 13 feet you know you're breathing everything that the person in the cubicle next to you is spewing out of course you're going to get sick i mean i've never been sicker than i was you know, the first year I spent in graduate school up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I took the, the MBTA, the, you know, the, the T every day, the subway and, you know, grabbed onto those those hand railings and didn't wash my hands as much as I should have. And I caught a cold literally every single month and I caught the flu for the last time I ever had it. I haven't had the flu since I lived in Boston. But, you know, you're packed into those enclosed spaces. You're touching surfaces that other people who are sick are also touching, of course you're gonna get sick. Of course you are. But if you're living outside and you know sunlight, UV light, almost certainly breaks down the genome of this virus. So spend as much time outside as you can. You know That's the safest place to be right now. So uh, a person that I keep seeing uh, retweet your things, which I think is uh, fascinating, is uh, Nassim Taleb, who talks all about risk and probabilities and uh when to panic Black swan. yeah so was this a so he declares that this was not a black swan event do you agree with that no. was, it was not a black swan event i mean listen i i got interested in this i have a phd in human population genetics um i'm an evolutionary biologist but I took a lot of virology classes. I worked in a virology lab as an undergraduate at MD Anderson. Um, you know, I've been paying attention to this whole field for a long time. I read Laurie Garrett's book, The Coming Plague, which is kind of the Bible of emerging diseases. It came out in 1994. Read it cover to cover as soon as it was released. New York Times bestseller. Um, emerging diseases are fascinating to me. And everybody in the emerging disease community has been saying for years something like this is going to happen which is why we have plans in place which apparently in the united states were ignored 
And that's the reason why America has been the hardest hit country of all. America has a third of the confirmed infections, but 4.2% of the world's population. I mean, look at the numbers. Why is that? Because literally people chose to ignore what Nassim has called a white swan. You know, we, we knew the black swan was coming and therefore it's a white swan. Some people might call it a gray swan. You know, it's somewhere in between, like we knew it was coming, but it was uncertain when. But honestly, anybody in the emerging disease community who studies zoonoses like this, anybody who looked at what was going on with SARS in 2002, 2003, MERS in 2012 in the Middle East, my wife has had MERS. We were in Abu Dhabi last year. I was teaching a course at NYU Abu Dhabi. We went to a resort down near the Saudi border. She was snuggling up to some camels the night before we left. She had the flu and pneumonia <laughs> oh, and oxygen levels. No, 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 but this is serious. MERS is about 30% fatal. And we went into the emergency room at a very nice, you know, quite frankly, upper middle class, you know, Austin Hospital. We live in Austin, Texas. And I said to them, you know, you should test for MERS. And they said, what's MERS? And I said, you've got to be freaking kidding. Are you like, literally, I will give you the link to the CDC website. You should be taping up this room with plastic right now because it is a very deadly virus. Anyway, you know, I, yes, I, I think I think Nassim is right. You know, I, this is something we should have known about, but we chose to ignore and so that that's not a black swan. That's an idiotic white swan. <laughs> well, Nassim Taleb has this line, and I'll probably get it wrong, where he talks about um, bureaucracy is a system under which people are conveniently distanced from their own decisions. Um, and I think that we, in in many ways, we live in a democracy, but really we live in a in a in a bureaucracy where we're just filled with bureaucrats over bureaucrat, you know, meetings and groups. And uh, so to me, this this situation of why weren't we prepared seemed inevitable. Now people are locked in their houses or, or the people that don't have to be out working are. If you were going to try and take fate into your own hands, learn as much as you can, be as best prepared as you can to handle what what Spencer Wells, population geneticist, is referring to as the potential black plague, what should people be doing with their time right now? so that they can take control of their own response. You, you need to stay inside. I mean, li listen, if, if you are locked inside of a structure and you have no contact with the outside world or, you know, if there is contact, very protected contact where you wear a mask, masks are important. That's part of the reason Asia has done better in this pandemic than any other region because they wear masks there. Um, wash your hands too often. Like Howard Hughes, no, it'd be worse than Howard Hughes. Like wash your hands more than he would. Um, you know, just be super paranoid about this. Stay locked inside a structure with, you know, the members of your family or your immediate circle, whatever that is, who you know are not infected, you'll be fine. Literally, like this is not magic. It's not like, you know, some asteroid's going to come down and hit you and suddenly infect you. Um, you know, we know how to flatten the curve. And it's happening everywhere else in the world except America right now. I mean, I posted something this morning on Twitter, you know, showing that the U.S. is still in exponential growth in literally every other country with reliable data is starting to flatten it. Um, you know, I'm really worried about the states. And this is part of the reason we, we stayed in Indonesia is I made this call about three weeks ago where I was like, I don't really think they're taking this seriously enough. Like I went through LAX on February 27th, flying to Singapore. And there were people trying to grab my passport who were coughing into their hands before they reached out for it. And then other people who were like wiping their noses while TSA agents who, while they were going through my bags. And I was like, I'm not going to go back through that. You know, that, that is literally a Petri dish. And so many of them will get sick and die. And so many of the people who go through that will get sick and die. So, you know, we made this decision to, to stay in Indonesia. And, you know, I, I just hope that, you know, the U.S. starts to take this seriously. I mean, the, 
that this weird kind of fight, which shouldn't really be a fight, because again, you can't spend money when you're dead. This fight between like, let's get the economy restarted versus, you know, we have to save lives. You, if you don't save lives, there is no economy. You I know? think Spencer, I think, um, I think the fear that people that I can, that I can say, so I'm fairly well connected with people in the rural environment and their fear is and that they're going to is- do fine by the way. It's the people in the cities who I'm most concerned about, because if you have your own farm, like suddenly it's like being back in the middle ages. It's like the black plague era. If you have the ability to grow your own food, you're rich. It's like the, the revolution of the peasants in a way, you know? And so city dwellers, places like New York, if there's a problem in the food supply chain, they're screwed. But if you live in a place like Iowa, you know, and you can grow corn and you can grow tomatoes and raise your own pigs and chickens, like you'll be fine forever. You know, it's a really interesting reset to me. So I think that the, so the, this brings up two things. One, I was talking with uh, a cattle rancher that that described cities as CAFOs, which I thought was like uh, somewhat a, a jarring. But he was like, really, they are confined animal feeding operations where there are people living vertically. And if anything, yep. the, the benefit yep. of a CAFO is that you can have super high efficiency. But the downside is if something gets in there, you have really big problems. But the, the thing that I was going to bring up with you is, I believe that the people that are on the conservative side or on the rural areas, they are viewing this as a communist's dream. And I don't mean to make this as a joke. I mean it deadly seriously. They believe that this is a way to force as many people as possible onto the government dole while other people are out uh, working. And I think they can see whether they would name it this way or not, but the, the, the kulaks being demanded that they work and hand over all their goods – to the people that are sitting at home. And so I, I, yeah. I, I say this as like, you have to be able to address their fears with more than just, hey, you'll die. Absolutely. It has to be something like- I what have those same fears. Go ahead. I have those same fears. I mean, listen, I, politically, I would characterize myself as a, a centrist libertarian. You know, listen, I, I live in Texas. I own guns. You know, I believe in, in, you know, the value of rural America. I have friends who are farmers who do not live in cities, even though most of America does now live in cities and most of Texas now lives in cities. I choose to live in Austin, but, you know, that's for a lot of other cultural reasons and and so on, business reasons. Um, No, listen, I, I have very big concerns about this as well. And, you know, no one knows how this experiment's gonna play out. I do feel like, history is cyclical. I feel like, you know, everybody is a Keynesian when there's a crisis, you know, (laughs) the economist, you know, Keynes who famously said, you know, government needs to step in and provide support for the economy during things like the great depression. And, you know, this is what Obama did in, in, you know, 2008 and so on. Um, you know, I have very big concerns about this. Honestly, you know, I, I have big concerns about government debt. I like I, I'm asking myself, I've literally been, you know, researching for a couple hours a day. Like what happens when governments run out of money? Because we we came into this with with a huge amount of debt. And so what happens when we add billions, trillions of dollars to that debt again and we've got a 30 plus percent unemployment rate. Like, I, I don't know what's going to happen. It's it's unprecedented. This is why I'm saying this is so much bigger than anything in, in collective social memory. And so I get those concerns. I totally get them. And, and, you know, I agree with them to a certain extent. On the other hand, like, we've got to do something. We've got to keep people from dying of starvation and, and you know, keep people from obviously dying of the virus. Um, this is a really scary time and it's so unprecedented that people are throwing stuff at the wall and hoping it sticks. So the answer that I'm, I'm, I always try and get out of people and it's not that I have a different answer that I want to argue with people. It's let's say we flatten the curve. What then indicates to us that we can start 
opening up? I, is it an R not number that's below one, meaning that for every person that no. gets infected, is it, wh- no. what is it? No, no, because listen, if if everybody stays inside, as I said, we can bring R not down to zero. If there's no social interaction with people who are uninfected and infected, you will not infect anyone new. It's you know, this is basic you know epidemiology, but. The concern is that there are going to be waves. And so this really becomes a social slash political issue that as or not starts to come down, as the curve starts to flatten, there will be tremendous social pressure because of joblessness, because of economic, you know, disenfranchisement for us to start allowing people back into the community and we'll see another wave and then we'll have to lock down again and then we'll see another wave. We're seeing it in Singapore now. We've seen the hints of it in places like Japan and certainly in Wuhan, um, in China, although nobody really trusts the numbers that are coming out of, of China. But, you know, they're somewhere in this kind of scary area where it's like, OK, there are no new community infections. We release people. They go back to work. People start flying back into the country from elsewhere and infections go up. And so we have to lock them down again. And that is going to be so much more dangerous for the economy. And what is the solution to that? Well, vaccines potentially, but I have some concerns about vaccines simply because this is a virus that has infected, I think, potentially a billion people around the world, most of whom are asymptomatic. And so there's a huge reservoir of this. I don't think this is something that's going to go away. This is not SARS. This is not something that spiked and then, you know, died out. This is something that's going to become like the seasonal flu. And so we've got a huge number of people who have infections who can reinfect other people who may themselves become much sicker if their life circumstances change. And, you know, vaccines, if you introduce them into a population where there are, you know, a billion carriers of the virus each individual probably having multiple strains because of mutations and so on that happen, Um, you know, there's going to be selective pressure to evolve around that vaccine. I mean, remember that flu vaccines are only 10 to at most about 60% effective every year. (laughs) So people who get the flu vaccine and still come down with the flu. Yeah. Happens all the time because flus change a lot. They mutate a lot. That's going to happen with this as well. These conversations aren't happening. Spencer, these conversations about this is what a vaccine allows you to do. This is how much. This is the thing that I'm I'm grateful you're talking about it because this is not measles. Measles Measles can be locked down with a vaccine because of a particular set of circumstances and the way it's transmitted and and so on. Um, I'm hopeful about a vaccine. But I don't see it as the panacea for this. I, I think it's going to be more complicated digging out of this. So, uh, Spencer, one of the questions I find fascinating to hear from everyone is, what do you think the world will look like in two weeks? <laughs> two weeks? It's going to be pretty much like it is now. You know, I, I think, you know, the difference is going to be that people are going to be really tired of being locked up at home. I think there's going to be a lot more governmental pressure to release people. But, you know, you look outside the U.S. and every country is now starting to extend its lockdowns. You know, so, you know, it's happening in Europe. It's happening in Asia. It's going to happen in the U.S. too. I mean, one of the things that I've been kind of talking about on on my blog and, um, you know, on, on social media is you know, what are the companies that are kind of the, the canaries in the, the coal mine for this? And to me, Disney is the ultimate canary in the coal mine for this, because Disney is effectively a company that is designed for group social entertainment experiences, cruises, first release movies and theaters, theme parks, you know, all these things where lots of people come together in really tight and closed spaces. And Disney is being cremated by this. Um, you know, so in two weeks, there's going to be a lot of pushback from, you know, political leaders, from business leaders, like we need to get the economy back on track. 
And what worries me is we're then going to release things. People are going to go through this, you know, the series of waves and it's, you know, it's, it's going to kill more people and it's going to ultimately make the situation more difficult. And the only solution is one that, you know, I'm trying to outline now, which has to do with, you know, categorizing people into these risk pools based on genetic factors and other factors like age and the other. Oh boy. In a postmodernist world, you are going to get, you're going to get hell for this. Get, get ready, man. If you start posting about, (laughs) I mean, it's, it's true. People should know what their risk is, but in this, you know, so this actually brings up an interesting question. I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on this. I believe that there, the world is, at least in the U.S., is, is splitting into two groups. The traditionalists that think coronavirus is going to be something we get over and we go back to regular world. And then the post-coronalists, which is not a good term. What would you term these people over here that have accepted that we have a new reality? And is it more... Um, is there, a, is there a way to have a higher fidelity map of who is the post-coronalists? Well, you know, the, my, my friend Razib Khan, who I think you might follow on, I love on Twitter, yeah, yeah. Um, big blogger, and he, he actually works for me. He's a genius. I, I love Razib. Um, he's, I've he's been watching you, Corona Spencer, Hawks. because of Razib Khan. So when he first started that podcast, I was like, anyone that Razib is starting a podcast with is worth listening to. So anyway, a big shout out to that guy. And he's definitely worth following on Twitter. No, Razib is awesome. But, you know, he's he's called those of us who are, you know, seeing this through a glass darkly, so to speak. Um, you know, Corona, uh, you know, hawks or, you know, Corona negatives. I think the world inevitably is going to change. I think it's changed already. I mean, listen, dude, Tony Fauci, who is, you know, despite whoever Trump has, you know, appointed to head up this or that commission, Tony Fauci is the de facto head of the U.S. response. He said, I don't think we should ever shake hands again. Like, that's not the world I grew up in. (laughs) And that's happened in three weeks. (laughs) So I think the world's going to be a very different place. Um, For me, the question is, can we learn from this experience Um, in the same way, you know, I alluded to earlier where the, you know, the Black Death killed off half of the European population. And, you know, at a time when they were pre-capitalist, pre-industrialist, you know, land was wealth. um, Suddenly that meant that, you know, peasants could charge more for their labor and everybody became richer, and that led to you know the Renaissance. Um, I don't think we're going to see nearly the level of death. I think you know we're talking about a one percent mortality rate for this. But coming out of this, can we find a way to create a new Renaissance and you know make society more human? You know, I, I feel like we've gone too far down that path that Reagan, who Listen, I love Ronald Reagan, I think, was you know a great president in a lot of ways, but he did set in motion this you know capitalist supply side path that you know valued corporations over individuals. And I, I think it's time for a reset on that. And I think you know workers need to be valued more. I think people who make a dollar a day need to be valued more globally. And, you know, I feel like there's going to be enough political pressure moving forward that that's going to change. And I'm hoping that can make the world a better place. I'm not by no means a communist. I mean, I did most of my early field work in the post-Soviet era in Uzbekistan and places like that and saw people being paid in lottery tickets. Um, It it was a shithole. And I, I do not want that for America. But I do want America to reevaluate, you know, the role of individuals versus corporations. Mega corporations aren't necessarily good for society. You know, the fact that Apple is considering acquiring Disney because of its downturn right now and that it has the cash in its back pocket to do that. You know, that you should ask yourself, like trillion dollar corporations, Saudi Aramco. Okay. Yeah, we get that. Like you're sitting in the biggest bubble of easily obtainable petroleum in the world, but you know, a company that makes phones, 
or a company that sells data like Google, like should those be trillion dollar corporations at the expense of, you know, the average worker who, you know, 30 percent of whom will be out of work by this summer? Um, I think that's a reset that has to happen. Well, I think corporations are going to lose the sheen of being able to help and being so supportive and being so family oriented. There are a lot of white collar workers sitting at home right now, really grateful that they have a job, but not doing much on their stay at home. And they think their company is going to take care of them. And when it comes back, that the demand for whatever it was that they were supplying is no longer there, that you're going to see a shedding. And it's it's why I, I actually started warning my friends, like the coronavirus um, grilling photos that you're taking, you know, the the photos of how you're eating and you're sharing with other people. Stop it now. Because we're going to enter a different world. And one of the biggest differences between the Depression in the 1930s and today is that you are going to be able to peek into the haves in a way that the have-nots couldn't do before. The people in Kenya are oftentimes <laughs> extremely poor, yeah. and they don't know that other people, or at least when I was living there 15 years ago, they didn't know that other people were poor. But now they can see it. And, and that's going to create a whole different level of stratification in society that becomes um, uh, unstable in, in a world where the American dream is apparent. Well, and, and this is, you know, one of these unanticipated consequences that worries me. If this goes on to the extent that I suspect it will in the U.S., I hope it won't, but I suspect it will just because of the political pressures with these waves, with, you know, successive shutdowns, um, you know, and the breakdown in supply chains and people, honestly, like, who likes being cooped up inside? I mean, the divorce rate in Wuhan shot up by, like, 50% as soon as people were let out. Um, you know, people are, like, tired of this. But if it goes on for another few months or a year, I hope it doesn't. But if it goes on for, you know, that length of time, there's going to be social unrest, especially if you add, you know, some sort of food shortage, because... You know, riots are born on empty bellies. You know, when people get hungry, they get out the guillotines and the guns and the pitchforks and they go after the people who who have food. And, and it so can if you're be a triggering event, it, it can even be that's the my that's my greatest fear with mobs is because mobs start to develop an intelligence that is different than rationality. And the intelligence says this is the weak point that we can go push on to make something change. And we don't care how it changes. We just don't want this anymore. And that's when you start having yeah. people point blame. You have scapegoats. I mean, frankly, it's why I think a lot of the wealthy people, the billionaires right now, are going to donate a quarter of their wealth as soon as possible because, I mean, I don't mean to be cynical. I think it's a wonderful thing that they're doing. But you want to pay in and be as big and philanthropic as you can, as early as you can, because the price is as low as possible right now. Yeah. No, I, listen, I, I, I think that's certainly true. But remember that the truly wealthy have a plan B. I mean, Peter Thiel has citizenship in New Zealand and an estate there and a private jet to fly him over. So, you know, if it comes down to it, the, the truly wealthy are going to be fine. You know, they'll be on their yachts. They'll be on their private jets. They'll be locked down in safe rooms. Um, you know, it's the average person. That's what worries me. I mean, I just feel like so much of the last 10 years, certainly, and really, you know, since the beginning of the Internet era with the creation of this entirely new revolutionary, massively well-funded industry that we've witnessed that I've been a part of. I mean, I was at Stanford in the 90s and I saw Yahoo go public. And I remember Larry and Sergey as, you know, two grad students in the computer science department developing an algorithm for searching the internet. And I was like, how is that ever going to make money? Well, yeah, it's a trillion dollar corporation. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, this this whole era, like, you know, it, it again, it's it's been this massive accumulation of wealth by a relatively small number of people. Um, that's kind of unprecedented in human history. And, you know, this isn't, we don't have time, you know, to get into universal basic income and job replacement by robots and, you know, AI and all that stuff. But, you know, this is really unprecedented in human history. And it's, it's brought a lot of good to the world, but it's also brought a lot of 
you know, disruptive change that's very scary. Well, Spencer, I am so glad that you were here today. If people wanted to follow your wild blog posting and your uh, Twitter, can you let them know where they can find that? Yeah, sure. So just follow me on Twitter um, at SP Wells, S P W E L L S, and um, same handle on Medium. That's where I'm blogging from right now. Um, so, yeah, you know, love to engage with you. I try to get back to people with DMs and questions and comments and everything else. So, yeah, it was great talking to you, man. Man, this was an honor. I really appreciate it. Stay safe in Indonesia. And we'll check back in a couple weeks, I think, and uh, find out how, how things fared in Thanks. your volcano-laden area. You too. All right. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>